And so we come to the second half of the first chapter of Paul's letter to Ephesus, to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, and I shall read verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. The Apostle writes, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the, day, in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Now the passage begins with a little phrase, for this reason. In fact, that's a phrase that shows up three or four times in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. What you must do when you see a phrase like that is remind yourself of what came before. Uh, for this reason points back to what Paul has already said. And in the first part of chapter 1, chapter 1, especially verses 3 to 14, Paul offers praise to God for all of the spectacular grace gifts that he's poured out on his people. Let me list a few of them. He's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, verse 3. He chose us in him before the creation of the world, so election. He predestined us for adoption to sonship, Verse 5, all of this to the praise of his glorious grace. He's given us redemption through his blood. Verse 7, the forgiveness of sins. And he's lavished on us an understanding of what the gospel is, how the Bible fits together. Not only so, but in verses 11 to 14, he's given us the promised Holy Spirit, the down payment of the promised inheritance. And this for both Jews and for Gentiles alike. Verses 11 and 12, spelling things out for the Jews. Verses 13 and 14, spelling things out for the Gentiles. And having written all of that in glorious poetry, then the apostle says, for this reason, I pray. In other words, if you want to find out why Paul prays as he does, what he prays for and why, you need to tie together Paul's understanding of the gospel with Paul's understanding of the place of prayer in the promotion of the gospel. For this reason, Paul offers, number one, thanksgiving for God's intervening sovereign grace, verses 15 and 16, and number two, intercession that God's sovereign, holy purposes in the salvation of his people may be accomplished, verses 17 to 19. Now we'll take those two points first. Paul offers us, for this reason, because God has done all of this, he offers us thanksgiving for God's intervening sovereign grace. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. In other words, at least some of the people to whom Paul was writing in his letter to the Ephesians, he wasn't there when they were converted. He heard about their conversion. He heard about their faith and love. We'll come back to those two words in a moment. He heard about their conversion, the faith they demonstrated, the love they're displaying. And in consequence of this, he hasn't stopped praying for them. So, so the question we need to ask ourselves is, when we hear that somebody's got converted somewhere, or when we hear that there's been a movement of God and uh, a, a group of tribes people in 
Papua New Guinea have really turned wonderfully to the Lord. What does that impel us to do? Oh, that's nice. Wish it could happen here. Or does it call from us prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of invocation as we invoke God's blessing on them for, for certain kinds of things? Paul says, well, since I've heard of your faith and your love, I haven't stopped giving thanks for you. In other words, there is an obligation, but not just an obligation, a privilege to, uh, to grasp that, that when you hear of the power of the gospel in transforming people's lives, when you hear of the effect of election and predestination and transforming love and the fruit of the spirit and forgiveness of sins and so on, all bound up with what the gospel is, then it should call forth almost automatically an overflowing sense of abundant gratitude. So also here. Now I should mention more about these two words, faith and love. In Paul, there are three words that are often read together, faith, love, and hope. They're often called the Pauline triad, the crown virtues, the fundamental virtues. They are related to each other in different ways, depending on the context. For example, in Colossians chapter one, faith, hope, and love are mentioned but it's rather interesting to see how they are tied together. In verse three of Colossians one, not unlike Ephesians, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, as here, faith and love is what he's heard about. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up in heaven for you. In this case, faith and love spring, from, spring up from the hope, the hope of what is coming in the inheritance that we've received in principle in Christ and will receive at the, the new heaven and the new earth. And the faith and love that are called forth are grounded on this hope. Elsewhere, we find faith, hope, and love put together more or less in parallel. In the well-known verse, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 13, now remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So here there are all three remaining, but one is greater than the other two, and the greater one is uh, love. So in this case, what Paul has heard about that he has uh, used in his mind to mark out their conversion is faith in the Lord Jesus, love for all of God's people. It's not just a privatized kind of religion. If there is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the object of the faith, but it works out in love for God's uh, uh, people, for the brothers and sisters in Christ of those who have been converted. I haven't stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he not only gives thanks, he remembers them in his prayers. What does he pray for? Well, in brief, he offers intercession that God's sovereign, holy purposes in the salvation of his people may be accomplished. Verses 17 to 19. He constantly remembers them in his prayers, he says. Verse 17, specifically, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So, in other words, there is intercession that God's sovereign, holy purposes in the salvation of his people may be realized. In particular, he prays for the knowledge of God. Verse 17. Well, of course, in one sense, uh, if they have become Christians, they do know God. But do you feel you know God better this year than last year? Paul prays for them. Not that they'll be free from all illness or disappointment or the hurly-burly of life. He prays for them above all that as Christians, they will know God better. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. In other words, it requires more than merely an intellectual reading of a book or two. It requires the work of the Spirit, doubtless through the means of grace, including reading and teaching and all the rest, to understand what you're reading, 
to gain the spirit of wisdom and revelation, God disclosing himself so that you may know him better. So whether you're praying for yourself or for fellow believers in your home church, in your own country, pray that the spirit of revelation and wisdom will so come upon the people of God that they will know him better. Now, there's already evidence that they do know him. They display faith and love. But now that they may know him better. And then what he prays for is more precisely spiritual insight. What might be called the subjective side of this disclosure by which we receive this revelation. Verses 18 and 19a. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. There's the third of the Pauline triad. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and the incomparably great power for us who believe. So in particular, Paul wants his prayer that they may know God better to be marked by three things. First, insight that we may grasp the hope of our calling, the hope of glory. Now, I've mentioned before that hope in modern English is something that you may or may not see fruit from. I hope to fly home at Christmas. Uh, but of course, I may have the flu and I won't be able to go or COVID will hit and I won't be able to fly or whatever. I, I hope so. There's an intrinsic element of doubt in the English word hope. But in Greek, there is no necessary doubt. Depends on the context. That's why the New Testament can sometimes speak of Christ's return as the certain hope. Hope is not so much putting a question mark on things in the Greek New Testament. It's putting an anticipation on things. This is what you look for. This is what you anticipate. It's what you long for. You hope for what you have not yet received, Paul says elsewhere. And so here, Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. To know the hope could either mean to know with certain anticipation the glory that's coming, or it could mean to actually see it come, to experience it, the hope to which he has called you. And then it's described the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, this wealth, this glorious inheritance is bound up in its consummation with Christ at his return. But even now, already, we enjoy all kinds of things. We are in Christ. And to put it another way, it includes the incomparably great power that God exerts in believers. Now, of course, in one sense, this power of God um, is displayed in believers when they are resurrected on the last day. Um, but already the power of God is displayed in believers in that they have become believers. That's the point of the first half of the chapter. That is, God has done all of these things to save his people from their sins. And um, that will come back in chapter 3 as well as we shall see. Now then, having introduced the theme of power, Paul goes on to talk about this power more specifically. His incomparably great power for us who believe, 19a. 19b, that power is the following. And that occupies almost all of Paul's attention then until the end of the chapter. That power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. In other words, he focuses first on the power exerted in Christ raised. If you wanted to talk about the power of God to an outsider, what comes to mind? Where do you go first? Let there be light. 
and there was light, the power of God in creation. Or the descriptions of God's order over the entire universe in several chapters of Job, where he upholds the world as if it's a ball hanging from a string. He casts the constellations Pleiades and Orion into the universe and controls them. He orders when the sun comes up, rises. The language, of course, is phenomenological. That's the way it appears to us as our planet rotates. God does all of that. Or some of the Psalms in which God is in charge of feeding the daily ration of the lions. He is in charge of the little bugs dancing in a sunbeam and of the mighty forces of nature unleashed. Shall we think of God's power in all of those terms? Well, we could. But, but you see, to compare God's power with God's power, that is, to compare what God does in one act of powerful display with another powerful act displayed in the universe, is in some ways, from our point of view, misleading. Because when we talk of greater and lesser acts of power, let's say in a strong person, a man or a woman who is given over to training for strength displays and competitions, how many hundred pounds can you bench press? Uh, or when you speak of power, you speak of how many horsepower in a, in a, in a, in a car or uh, how many uh, foot pounds of thrust there is uh, as a rocket takes off. And that is all comparable with another created thing, another machine, uh, another display. But how do you speak of comparative power when you're dealing with omnipotence. For omnipotence, there cannot be degrees of power. Is it harder for God to uh, create light than it is to blow up a mountain with a volcano? So what is looked for as the display, the crowning display of God's power? is not something big and melodramatic. It's something that is revolutionary. And the focal point here is on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So we read, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. And we're told that this power for which Paul is praying for the Ephesian readers is exactly the same power that was displayed in the empty tomb. That is so much against the order of things. It is so much against the, with what is the common way of God doing things in the world, in the universe. He reverses death itself. And that power that exerted itself when God raised his son from the dead is exactly the same power that is at work within you. Now, that's true even now. That's how we get converted. That becomes even more strongly put in chapter 2, as we shall see. But, um, but it's also true at the end of the age when we, too, will also be resurrected from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul can describe the resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. It's round one. It's a great display. It's the spectacular display of God undoing death. But it's the first fruit of a similar undoing of death for all of his people, too. And the same power that is at work within us now in transforming us, and then to prepare us for the new heaven and the new earth is exactly the power, not like the power, but exactly the power that God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. 
So here's a review of God's most dramatic display of power. And in the first instance, it's the power exerted in Christ raised. Then second, it's the power displayed in Christ exalted. We read, it's the power that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead, verse 20, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So here there is a picture of Christ not only raised from the empty tomb from the dead, but also raised spatially, shall we say? That is, raised to the right hand of the majesty on high, raised to the place of dominating rule over all creative beings, angelic and non-angelic, both in this age and in the age to come, both now and forevermore. Did you see, from the perspective of biblical Christology, there is a sense, of course, in which Christ, in his pre-incarnate glory, has always had that power. He doesn't receive anything that he never had before. In fact, all created processes were under his control. Without him was not anything made that was made. So exactly why then is the raising of Christ to the right hand of God seen as such a magnificent display of power? Well, the point is, of course, that the one who's receiving this magnificent raising to the right hand of God is not the pre-incarnate word alone. It's the God-man. We sometimes forget that Jesus Christ is now and forever will be a human being. Now, because of our culture, which is suspicious of supernatural claims, we spend a lot of time as Christians proving that Jesus is God. But one of the things that's most striking is that Jesus is human. Oh, it's not striking when you read the gospel accounts. An extraordinary human, but human, that's pretty clear. He can be hungry and tired, fall asleep at the back of a boat, want something to drink, need food, and all the rest. And even such emotions as love are ascribed to him. He loves Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He has friends. But now that Christ has risen from the dead, is he still a human being? Now, in the New Testament, he remains a human being, so that the, the being, the God-man, fully God and fully man, is receiving something that, as the God-man, he never had. As the pre-incarnate Word, as the Eternal Son, of course he had all authority, along with his Father. But now, as the God-man, he has all authority, and he is the God-man who has received it. He has not only experienced God's power in being raised from the dead, but he's experienced God's power in being raised spatially, metaphorically, to the right hand of God's side. And that marks him out as, as the God-man over all other beings, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. It is spectacular. So for all eternity, our Savior will always be our brother. That's fundamental New Testament Christology. For all eternity, the one who bore our sins in his own body on the tree bore them as the God-man. The one who has all authority over all beings, both in heaven and on earth, both now and forever, world without end, is not simply the Creator God, but the God-man. And insofar as we participate in His humanity, we participate in some sense in His reign. We too are human beings. 
Now that takes us to some theology that comes from Hebrews, so we'll set that aside at the moment. But here the emphasis is on the power of God that is exerted in us to transform us, being supremely manifested first in raising Christ from the grave and second in raising him to the Father's right hand, a mark of his power. And then thirdly, it's not only the power exerted in Christ raised and the power displayed in Christ exalted, but the power exercised by Christ, the head over everything, for the church. Now that's remarkable as well. It's not only the power, which is what Paul is praying for, that we experience, but the power of Christ for the church. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In other words, this display of power in Christ, in Christ exalted, in Christ before that raised from the dead, this display of power is for the church. That he is over all beings in heaven and on earth is for the church. That he makes the universe run and keep its ordered pattern is for the church. In other words, although you don't want to discount the truth that Christ is exercising his authority over all things in heaven and on earth, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth, yet more focally, it's for the church. That's why when Christ says something like, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me, against it. The reason why we can be confident that this promise will work out itself in time and space is precisely because of the power that is Christ's. There is no doubt who is going to win. It may seem that Christians are her terribly abused in some countries. It may seem that certain ideas are are coming along that are crushing Christian thought in the West. But on the other hand, on the long haul, there will always be a faithful remnant. The remnant will grow. Persecution may come, but in that respect, we're merely following the example of Christ. And at the end of the day, it's the very power of God displayed in Christ Jesus, the God-man, which guarantees that it is for the church's good as it is for the son's glory. The son's glory is spe specifically mentioned in the first part of chapter one. We get the phrase recurring, for the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glorious grace, to the praise of his glory. It keeps returning and returning and returning. But now more focally, it's for the praise of his glory as he manifests his glory, his grace, his power, for the church. So when we pray, we should be praying for things that are bound up with what the gospel is about. Sometime it's worth listening at a prayer meeting for the things that people pray for. Now I want to insist in the strongest possible terms that we can pray for anything. As Peter puts it, we can cast all our cares on God because God cares for us. Nothing is too small. Nothing is too unimportant. If we are concerned about something, whether it's a, a temporary rash or a financial struggle or a nasty cold or something that is earth shattering and personally challenging, an existential threat, or something that has to do with worldwide mission, all of it, all of it, all of it, we are invited to pray for precisely because God himself cares for us. But still, it is worth stopping to ask what in particular 
does Paul pray for? And in this chapter, we'll see it again in chapter 3. In this chapter, Paul prays in particular for those things that are bound up with our salvation. That's what brings us back to the opening phrase in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about all that God has done in you by his sovereign power, for this reason, I haven't stopped giving thanks and I haven't stopped praying and this is what I prayed for. And what he has prayed for depends on the display of God's power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that raised him to the Father's right hand. And all of this is for the church. Which is why we can come before our Heavenly Father with great confidence. We serve a God, we approach a God in prayer. who comes to us and the power that he displays is that which has been demonstrated in him. He who has been appointed head over everything for the church. Let us pray. We bless you, Heavenly Father, that... Um, The power of God is not merely on display for the sake of being on display, but it has as its goal the fulfillment of all of your purposes for the church. We take great confidence, Lord God, from this reality that the same power that brought Christ back from the dead will bring us back from the dead too. The same power that seated him at the Father's right hand seats us being identified with him at the right hand of God, too. This is the God who chose us from before the foundation of the world, who, who loved us to the praise of his glorious grace, who lavished on us grace with great abundance so that with wisdom and understanding we might understand and grasp the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, that we might have this hope this hope of an, internal, of an eternal inheritance in his holy people. So we commit ourselves to you, Lord God, and ask for a vision, for revelation, that we may know you better, according to what you have disclosed of yourself in your most holy word, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.